Uh, I also want to thank you all for being here in the Zoom room with me. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to have fun today. So I just want to go over how I thought it would be cool to do this webinar and kind of break it into a couple of parts. So I want to talk about um, the story of how I got into regenerative agriculture, how I found it, um, and then also my past work and lessons learned and now my current work and my current passion. Um, and at that point, I'm going to pause for any questions or comments. Um, and then I want to go into bigger picture ideas and some ponderings that I'm having, um, kind of get a take from anybody who wants to engage with that and see what you all think. Um, and then I want to hear from the audience, you know, anything you feel moved to share with how you got into regenerative agriculture, any struggles you're having or successes, anything like that. I think these, um, these moments of storytelling, I think, are so, so important and have the power to really move all of us forward together. Um, and then at the very end, I want to leave a few minutes to share some powerful words from Clarissa Pinkola Estes as well. Um, so part one, how I got into regenerative agriculture. Um, actually, I'll just go back to when I was age four. My, um, it kind of helps explain kind of my whole life path. But my uncle was fishing on this really cute little pond near where I grew up in uh, southwest Colorado. And he had one of those tubs of worms that have, you know, the soil in them and everything. And at one point he wasn't looking and I thought, you know, these worms, they need to be released. So I grabbed the bucket and I ran over and I, I, uh, <laughs> I released them somewhere out in the forest. And I came back and he's like, Mandy, where are my worms? And I was like, well, they're free now. <laughs> and that basically kind of set me up for my whole life path. I've always been so so wanting to help the environment and animals and every speech or anything I ever did in school was based on that. Um, I ended up getting my degree in college in sociology and environmental affairs. And what's cool about that is my degree actually found me. I wasn't really aiming for any degree in particular. I was just taking classes I thought were interesting. And so my uh, end of my junior year, I went to my career counselor and I was like, what, uh, what degree am I gonna get? And she's like, what? And um, she said, well, let me look at your transcripts. And she's like, it looks like sociology and environmental affairs. And I was like, perfect. That's what I love studying. And at the end of my senior year, I wrote a paper on biodynamic farming and winemaking. And that was the first time in my life I had found something so, so amazing in terms of how it connected with nature and the phases of the moon. And it just felt like there was this really beautiful interconnection that I had not ever found before. Didn't even know there was anything like it, but it was kind of this like one time thing in my life. And then I kind of went back to normal life. That was like my mid twenties. And then in my early thirties, I started watching some documentaries. Some of the big ones um, at that time were Forks Over Knives, Cowspiracy. Um, I watched uh, The Human Experiment. That one really got me going on pulling all of the toxic household cleaning supplies and body care products out of my cupboards and replacing those. Um, so documentaries can be really powerful. You know, they're storytelling tools. Um, and one that really impacted me was Food Inc. After that, I decided I can't be involved in the industrial meat system anymore. You know, it was kind of like all of my life, I'd kind of known something wasn't quite right, but I didn't really know what. I didn't know there were other alternatives. Um, it was just kind of being in that mode of living in modern society. And, um, and so once I decided, well, I can't be involved in that anymore, my husband and I both decided to go um, vegetarian with the goal of being vegan. I know a lot of people um, go down that path. And so I, you know, for us, it was like the first two weeks, we actually did great. It was almost like a cleanse. We felt really good. And then right at the beginning of that third week, both of us just crashed. Our energy was in the tank and it was just like, this isn't gonna work, I don't feel good. I was a personal trainer at the time. I couldn't get through my classes well of teaching people. Um, and so I thought, okay, if we're gonna go back to meat eating, I need to know where it comes from. I need to know the farmer, know the rancher. So I started really looking into this. Um, at that time, we lived in Littleton near Denver. And I, so I was looking all over the front range and there are amazing farmers and ranchers up there doing amazing stuff. And so we started sourcing locally and I thought, all right, my new passion, I'm gonna start an LLC. So I had this for-profit business that I started in late 2015 called Tri Green Rising. And my whole point with that was to help people source organic, local, non-toxic, sustainable food product services. So I went on that for about a year and a half. And then about mid 2017, I was down in Durango, Colorado, which is where I live now. 
Um, and I was going on a tour at the James Ranch, which is an amazing regenerative ranch just north of Durango. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Uh, they've been around since the 60s. They started doing regenerative agriculture in the 90s. Um, and I was going on a tour led by Dave James. And I was walking with him up to the, the you know, tractor and trailer that we're getting on to go around the ranch. And I was telling him all my excitement. I was like, I'm starting this business. I'm going to help people source organic, non-toxic, local, sustainable. And he says, well, Mandy, sustainable is not the term. It's regenerative. And I was like, huh. I didn't know what that meant. I hadn't heard that before. This was only five years ago. And um, so I was like, all right. So we get on the tour. I was completely enthralled with everything he was describing. It was amazing. It was holistic. It was interconnected with nature. And it felt very much like when I had found biodynamic farming. Um, so this is my second time in my life that I was like, ooh, there's this amazing thing that's, you know, interconnection with nature and with each other and relationships and soil health and all of these things. So I went home back to the front range at that time. And I started trying to find what I could on regenerative ag. And even five years ago, there wasn't that much. Um, so I found holistic management by Alan Savory and Jody Butterfield. I found um, gaining ground by Forrest Pritchard. Um, Folks, This Ain't Normal by Joel Salatin. Um, a lot of really cool books that really helped me dive in and wrap my head around this. And, um, and so, you know, the more I took that in and the more I really embodied and, and really had that kind of feeling of that aha, like, wow, this is really it. That's what I wanted to teach on. So I started gathering community around this. I started doing talks and presentations, webinars, all this kind of stuff. And what I was doing, I did this for about three years all the way up until COVID, um, I was doing about 45 minute talks that were diving into the history of how we got here and scientific facts and sociological, psychological aspects of this thing. I mean, it was so much information and I would literally see people just kind of get overwhelmed and glaze over. And I just, I couldn't really accept that that was a thing. I was like, well, they have to know all this information. So I'm just gonna keep going. And, um, you know, when COVID hit, it gave me a chance to kind of reflect and really think about, you know, if I really want this movement to happen, what, what should I do? What should I change? And so it was actually a really needed pause for me. Um, and then uh, uh, it was about, yeah, 20, mid 2020, my husband and I went on the road. I was just kind of reflecting on everything and we ended up moving to Durango in 2022. So this year and earlier this year, I started chatting with the folks at the James Ranch about how can we really get people to understand and really feel regenerative agriculture? And, you know, it's, I think a lot of people think, you know, ranches and farms like that, they're doing organic grass fed, you know, beef or whatever veggies. And it's like, well, it's so much more than that. And how do we get people to really see that? And so I came up with this idea of doing more of a storytelling art version with um, digestible, scientific facts and did you knows just to try to basically in my my way of viewing it is to pull people down the regenerative rabbit hole it was like let me lead you in with some of these cool ideas we have so we're doing these big storyboards um so they're like huge panels um one that we just printed is a four foot by four foot and if you've been to the james ranch you walk up to the market and there's a whole external wall that you walk down and then you take a right and then there's another wall right before you get up to the order counter and, um, and this is something that can be customized for, for any ranch, whether it's on a website or at your actual farm or ranch, but I'm wanting to help farms and ranches be able to really explain, you know, what it is that they do and the meaning. Um, so anyway, when you get up to the market, you'll see an intro panel. We're still formulating all of this. And then I've chosen to do um, beneficial animal impact, soil, water, and atmosphere. And we've chosen characters that are going to represent each one of those and then tell the story of regenerative agriculture from their perspective. So we have a dairy cow um, who, and if you have a bison ranch, it can be a bison, uh, but the dairy cow is gonna be telling the story of her animal, her beneficial impact on the land when she's moved the way that nature intended. Um, she'll be telling that story. We have a dung beetle telling the story of soil health. We have mycorrhizal fungi as a cute little character telling the story of water and how micro, like the whole relationship of mycorrhizal fungi with root systems helps to 
create soil aggregates, which help create por you know porosity in the soil, which can hold more water. Um, we have a dung, or sorry, uh, we have a bee telling the story of how um, her plant and flower friends pull down carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it, and how they also release water vapor and help to seed the local rainfall, the small water cycle in your local watershed and how that actually helps to balance the whole hydrologic cycle like across the globe. Um, and then it's once we, and actually um, if you could share that one about this, the, the panel with the cattle in the middle, um, we're gonna do a screen share so you can see this one. So this was the first one we just printed. And this one is gonna be, um, you have all of these things coming together. I wanted to show how all of those characters are all working together and all of their impact and all the amazing things happening on the land. So you'll actually see the mycorrhizal fungi hugging the tree root. Um, you'll see the dairy cow with her herd. Uh, we've got a dung beetle who's um, bringing down the dung into the soil. There's this cute little um, zoom in that we have on there that's showing these microbes with like a bib and a fork and a knife that are all excited about their meal that's coming. Um, we've got a couple of bees in the upper left hand corner that are showing the carbon drawdown and sequestration that are showing the water vapor release from the leaves. It's, it's super cute. And so we we're just getting ready to install it at the James Ranch this week, but the people who have seen it have just loved it and it's so cool because they get pulled into it you know i've gotten the um, the privilege of partnering with a local artist here in durango a graphic designer and a sign printer and i'm just so so grateful because it's really like this vision is coming to life and people are loving it so um and then i don't know if you were able to share that panel or not but if we're not able to show those today, um, we can add that into the email tonight. But anyway, uh, and then we have another panel that's a gratitude panel. So it's basically showing the, you know, the whole scene of these characters from their back. Um, actually, are, are we able to show that? I actually have the art right here if we're not able to. I don't know if maybe it doesn't work for you to answer me right now. Are you talking about the first line? Um, yeah, well, the first one was the one with the, the little circles around it with the dairy cows in the middle. Were you able to share that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it didn't come up on my screen, so I didn't know. I will share now. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with me. Uh, and now you get to see my exciting non-webinar-related uh, stuff. <laughs> All right, are you seeing that? Yes, I see it. I'm hoping everybody else is too. So yeah, so you'll see, so we have these little kind of fact boxes. They have these little did you know facts in there, um, some different explanations, but we're trying to keep it really simple. So that was going from my lessons learned when I was doing all of my huge in-depth talks to how do we really boil this down to what, what we really want people to understand, like what are the really foundational pieces to get people to kind of come to that place of like, wow. Um, so that's this panel. And this is the sixth panel in a series of seven that are gonna go up at the market and grill. Um, and then that next panel, do you have that one um, that has the, the backs of them? So this is our um, gratitude panel that will be right before the menu, before you go up to order. So this is just wanting people to kind of have that sense, you know, that more of that visceral emotional response of like, wow, this is amazing, I'm supporting something amazing, I'm part of something amazing, um, and, and just kind of that feel good thing. So they're all looking up at the Milky Way. And uh, if you know this fact about dung beetles, they actually navigate by the Milky Way, at least some of them do when they roll the dung balls. So it's kind of fun because the dung beetle in there is pointing up at the Milky Way. So anyway, um, and then you'll see the little mycorrhizal fungi down there underneath the root. So it's a fun little scene of gratitude. Um, yeah, so that's what we're working on. And it's it's really exciting because I think it has the potential to, to get to more people in a different uh, format. And we're also doing a self-guided tour that's gonna go out um, around there, um, you know, over to the dairy barn and down by the gardens and stuff. And we're gonna have uh, one of the panels out there too, the one that she previously showed. And that's gonna have a couple of explanatory panels on the sides that do like a overview of regenerative agriculture and then an overview of what the, the impact that ruminant animals have when they're moved in terms of like the electric fencing basically mimicking predators um, out in the wild. So yeah, I think, I think it's gonna be really cool. So um, 
anyway, I, I, I also do talks to help deepen people's understanding and excitement about this as well um, and can use the panels to do that. So at this point, I'll just pause and see if anybody has any comments or questions. And if not, that's cool. <laughs> Anything coming in? Okay, all right, perfect. We'll go on to part two. So part two is more this bigger picture and um, kind of some ponderings that I'm having in terms of how we get this movement to move more and move more deeply um, in society. So when I look at you know just global issues today and you look at mindset, that to me is a root cause of what's going on. And then you look at what is the root solution? Also, it's mindset in my view, because that's what determines our habits, our decisions, the way we interact in the world, how we see ourselves in the world. And currently, you know, our, our mindset of modern society is very industrial, very mechanized, very separate from each other and from nature. Um, like, like we're not dependent on each other and yet we are, and we're dependent on nature, but we act like we're not, you know, and it's like, we we really lost that connection and relationship. Um, and we inherited this, this mindset and this global system. Um, and, and now everything's tied to it. So it's hard to imagine how we can extricate ourselves from that without everything tumbling. And so it's, it's gonna take a lot of uh, creativity and a lot of connection and community engagement. Um, and, in, and what's needed in my opinion is really switching to a regenerative mindset. Um, it's really a paradigm shift and it's learning from regenerative principles. We can learn from, all these different things. And fortunately, the regenerative movement is really seeking wisdom from indigenous peoples and cultures. And we need to do more of that because this is not a new thing. Um, we've just lost our way for a long time. Um, but there's, there's so much to learn and there's so much hope in that. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're learning to think more regeneratively and holistically, it can really change everything like it did for me. I mean, I'm someone who have, I've always cared about the environment, but I didn't know that some of the decisions or actually most of the decisions I was making were having a negative impact on you know, the environment, on the climate, on other people. I, I didn't know that there was another option. Um, and so when I look at it from the perspective of, I'm someone who really you know, would be into this, but I hadn't found it. It's like, we've got to get this message out there more. Um, and although there are many barriers to this movement, there are two main ones that I just wanna recognize. One is socioeconomic stratification and inequality. And that is a result of this system and our history and it's, it must be rectified. And fortunately, I mean, there's a lot of groups doing work on this. And fortunately, I feel that is really a part of this movement as well, that that goes along with it. Because when you're thinking about regeneration really being about relationships, I feel like that's a natural part of it, that as we start to see each other as humans again, and as we have empathy for each other and for nature, naturally things are going to become more equal, but wow, we have, we have a lot of work to get there. And then the other one I wanna talk about is the innovation adoption bell curve. Um, so this one, if you're looking at like the bell curve of how people view a new idea, and resistance, resistance to change and things like that. That first part of the bell curve, those are people who like all of us on this right now, it's like we are all into regenerative agriculture, we get it, we know why it needs to happen more and, and it's amazing, right? Then you have that next kind of bigger chunk of the bell curve. Those are people who, if they knew more, like me, they would do more. It's like, yes, I wanna be involved. Like how do, how do I become more involved? Where do I find these kinds of foods? That kind of stuff. Um, that next chunk of the bell curve, those are people who they might dabble, you know, here and there. And then that last part, they're not gonna change unless there's no other option, right? And fortunately, we don't need everyone. It's, there is a tipping point somewhere and this movement is really gaining traction. And so that, that gives me a lot of hope because Fortunately, we don't have to get everyone to understand and to buy into this. Well, buy in is not really a word I wanna use, but really get involved. And um, so I, I think there's a lot of hope in that. I, you know, an example that I was, um, I just read this article 
um, about, do you remember the band Groove Armada? I remember their music from like the early 2000s. Um, one of the band members named Andy Cato, uh, this article said he was about 15 years ago reading a story um, or reading an article about regenerative agriculture while he was on the train. And he was like, wait, what? Kind of like I was. And so he started doing some regenerative gardening and started doing some farming. And, um, and then he really got into it. And so he sold the rights to his songs so that he could buy a farm and go bigger, right? And like get more people involved. And, um, and I just think that's, that really shows the power of passion and knowledge um, and what people can do. You know, it's like not everyone's going to do that, but there are people out there who will. And it's like, if we're looking at scaling up this regenerative movement, we need more small and medium farms and ranches doing this kind of work. Um, so to get more traction in the regenerative movement, yes, we need education, but we really need that aspect of getting to the heart of this and getting more of that emotional aspect for people, the, the nostalgia, you know, um, and that, that really, you know, tugs at the heartstrings and makes you feel like you're really involved in something and really committed, not just, you know, in terms of your own health, but in terms of the planet, in terms of the amazing regenerative farmers and ranchers doing this work. Um, and a quick side note I do want to chat about real quick is the recent um, partnerships for climate smart commodities, the USDA funds that just got awarded. There are some amazing people and projects who got that funding um, and very deserving. I'm so excited about that. But as I looked through who got funded, it seems like a lot went to huge corporations, which is sadly not surprising. Um, I know there are a lot of small farm, small regenerative farmers and ranchers out there who are upset about this, who feel unsupported, unseen. Um, but the thing I want, I mean, I don't want to get into all of that because it's a really emotionally touchy subject. But the thing I want to point out with this is that's not really the root of this whole thing, right? It's like, yes, we need funding. Absolutely. But a one-time government infusion of money isn't really gonna solve this bigger problem if we don't have communities who surround these farmers and ranchers and understand and are committed to them, right? So it's like, yes, we need funding. Yes, we need that to happen more, especially in our current society and, and the way that we operate, but it's not the real root of this. We need more community, more relationship, more of a feeling of like a sense of place and the fact that you're committed to, to this whole movement and to the people who are involved. Um, so in, in my view, the ultimate goal is really to get to the heart, the emotion, the visceral response of this whole thing. And when you get to the heart, you get to the mind and it changes everything just like it did for me. Um, it drives our perception of the world, our place within it, our relationships, our decisions and habits. And, you know, when you look at history, the most powerful and meaningful movements happen because of passionate grassroots community, um, collective action, like fighting for what is good and what is right. And what's really cool is our superpowers as humans are cooperation and collaboration. And it's like, the more we use that, the more we do that, the stronger it gets, because you know, I'm sure everyone knows what I'm saying when you go to a conference, like the Amazing Regenerate conference that's coming up, there's something there. It's intangible, but you can feel it. There's this aspect of connection and warmth when you're talking with someone on a level that's more deep and you're getting a sense of what that person has been through and what their story is and where things are going and you feel connected and like you're in something together. There's massive power in that. And, you know, cooperation is really the driving force of nature. It's not competition, as previously thought. Um, just look at all that we're learning with root systems and all of the communication and nutrients transferred and water transferred, they share, you know? And so when we're in cooperation and in collaboration with one another, we can do amazing things. Um, so my passion and my focus, obviously, is how to get people to really feel this movement. And, you know, regeneration at its core is about relationships. And so I, I just want to give an example of something I just had happen that I think really um, highlights how this can change your perception of the world. So even though I've always loved nature, I've always had this fear of bugs and spiders and everything. I, I wish I didn't, but that was like my childhood. Um, but as my view has changed and as I see these beings as these amazing beings on this planet, 
I've changed how I view them. And now I go out of my way to protect them. So we had some friends who lived across the way from us in a condo. Um, and right outside their condo was this huge orb weaver spider. She was beautiful. She was white uh, with all these like brown markings on her and she was massive and her web was huge. So you had to like duck to get around it. And I, you know, she was fine while they were living there. But once they left, which was just like two weeks ago, I was like, you know, I'm worried that someone's going to see her and get scared and kill her. And so I was like, told my husband, we've got, we've got to relocate her. I really didn't want to relocate her because that was her home. But I thought, you know, if she's going to have the kind of chance that she needs to survive where I'm going to, we're going to do it. So we took her up to a lake that has a lot of, you know, forest around it just north of us and put her on a rock and, and said goodbye um, and good luck. But anyway, that's, that's the kind of power that this has. I mean, did I ever think I would be, you know, saving this huge or, and for, in Colorado, that's a big spider. <laughs> so it was, it was really cool. So I think that's the power of this different way of seeing. And a regenerative mindset really involves you know, seeing, seeing things differently. And the things I like to talk about when I do education on this is really the impact that it has when you support small local regenerative farmers and ranchers. You're keeping money in the community in those farmers and ranchers pockets instead of big corporations. Um, you're reducing your overall carbon footprint. You're helping to draw down the legacy load of carbon in the atmosphere that's up there. You're helping to regulate global temperature because the more roots we have in the ground, the cooler the ground temperature is, and that corresponds to the whole global climate as well. We also have more water that is transpiring from plants and grasses and everything, and that is helping to seed that local uh, rainfall in that small water cycle. Um, we're increasing biodiversity. You've got local nutrient-dense food. There's so many positives. And when people really start to have that aha, they get more committed and it's just a beautiful thing. Um, so I think there's a lot of regenerative potential. Um, just like, and I'm sure some of you or all of you know this, just like there's a dormant seed bank in the, in the ground, just waiting for the right conditions. I believe it's the same in the fabric of society. I feel there's a dormant seed bank of creativity and connection and love that is right there waiting for the right conditions. And, um, and you know, if, if you imagine like what it would be like if more people thought like this um, and really wanted to be involved and connected, there's a lot we can do. Um, so ultimately in my view, I truly believe the fate of the world depends on more of us connecting like this. And you know, if we keep this mindless, you know, consuming, industrial consuming we're doing right now, it's, we really are done. Um, and so I just feel like there's, there's a lot of hope and a lot of um, ability for not just nature, but our bodies to regenerate. That's nature's natural way of being is to regenerate and heal. So when we stop impeding um, that health and that vitality, things can regenerate really quickly. So even though we're on this, you know, kind of dark and doom path, I think there's a lot we can do and it can happen more quickly than we might realize. Um, and so that's kind of where, where I'll end with that. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to share their own story of how they got into regenerative agriculture or anything you're, you're dealing with or just fun stuff you wanna share about it. Um, I, I can start with a question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a producer, but just in talking about the work I do, I find sometimes um, like you bring up a cow and <laughs> people get super like that's not the answer. And, and I feel like a lot of times I try to like support with um, articles or movies or, you know, the thing, all the things I know and seen over the years, but it, it's met with like still a lot of, um, I don't know, like animosity. Like, do you have any suggestions of how to really support your viewpoint without just sounding like you're spewing back data or? whatever it might be. Yeah, well, when you, when you talk about that, I think of the huge vegan movement that's happening and cows are bad, right? Um, and so and that's, what, that's a cool thing with this too, is that I talk about being a regenerative vegan or vegetarian. It doesn't matter what you eat, it matters where it comes from, right? So I, I think there's like this huge kind of divide right now. And it's like, we're on the same team. We're doing the same work, but we have different ways of looking at the problem. And so, in, in my view, it's kind of like, well, let's, let's really talk about it though. Let's talk about 
what you're doing to the land and how how that either regenerates or degenerates, right? And to me, the, the biggest thing is when people realize, you know, if you look at a, a huge pasture and there's cattle all over that pasture, that's not regenerative, you know? It's like, it's moving them in this very specific way, but that is such a small, I think the last um, thing I heard was it's like 0.03% of agriculture in the world is regenerative. And it's just, we're, we're just not thinking like that, you know? So I think that to me is the biggest aha for people. It's like, we're on the same side and let me explain why. And that's the first thing I talk about is the reason North America was so insanely fertile when pioneers first got here and, and started you know, plowing up the land is because the bison had been moving on it for all of that time, regenerating it and not returning to that same piece of land until it had regenerated. And so when you explain that in the context of like a, even a small farm, like there's one just south of James Ranch, I think is probably only three acres and they're literally doing many region. It is, I love it every time we drive by and it's, it's very small, but they're moving, you know, the few cows that they have in a way that is regenerating that land and you can just see it exploding. So I think it's kind of like, well, look at the full life cycle analysis of what you eat. Where is that impossible burger coming from? Like what happened to that land prior? And it's, and it's, it's hard to get to that place of conversation without that defensiveness coming up, but it's like, let's try and see how we're alike because we have the same goal, right? Um, even if you think I don't, I do, but I'm looking at the big picture. Let's, let's think about how nature really operates. So that's my best way of saying how I deal with it. <laughs> Just as like a little follow-up, I, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but I feel like the truth like has gotten to be a pretty like subjective thing. And so like, I feel like any trying to talk about things in a factual way is like people are like oh no <laughs> you know so that's some interesting related thing I don't know if anyone else in in this whole call has dealt with that in some way or has thoughts about how to I mean maybe it's just how our society is right now but I will say that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this storytelling art version because it gets past all of that and it's like look at how cute <laughs> I mean, it's like when you really look at that thing, you're like, oh my God, there's a microbe with a bib on it. That's ridiculous. And so it's almost like it breaks down that, that barrier of like, oh, I'm right, you know? And it's like, we don't, we need to stop staying in our corners of like, who's right and who's wrong. It's like, we all want the same thing, you know? So yeah, it's, that's one of the ways I'm trying to work on it, but it's, it's frustrating and it's sad, right? <laughs> Anybody else want to share? Hi. Okay. Um. Well, thank you for everything you've been saying. It's uh, it's very inspiring and um. For example, regenerative agriculture. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm from. I'm studying in Brazil, and I'm from Chile, and I'm. Uh, I'm in the U.S. currently in the Oregon State University, trying to uh, study regenerative agriculture. That's what I'm here, because um, regenerative agriculture. I, I mean, like the name, it's not very well spread in South America as it is in here. For example, um, so I was kind of uh, chasing that, but we have some really good examples in South America, especially in Brazil, about how this uh, this this community feeling or these feelings of a kinship with nature, or um, how are we changing the ways we see nature is is expressed because. Uh, but sometimes not under the label of regenerative, they are doing very regenerative things. We have a huge movement in Brazil. It's um well, it's it's based upon based on like agroecology ideas. Uh -huh. So um what I want to say is just that I I started studying regenerative agriculture um from a PhD basis. Okay, so I'm a PhD student. So 
because I decided to go and study regenerative agriculture because I, when I finished my master's degree, I just had it with my professor and I majored in agronomy and it was based on the, this mainstream conventional agriculture that was the base. Right. So I went to do like anything else. And then at some point, um, I went to Uruguay to a workshop and they told me about this regenerative agriculture. He said, that's a multi of thing. And it just kind of clicked. It was just, it made sense all of a sudden. It's a, it's a, all this thing I've been rejecting like for years, like yeah. uh, producing cows, producing cattle. Uh, it made sense uh, in terms of a, like in a very like technical way, uh, but also like the gut feeling, which is, yep. I think it's, it's really important and really hard to communicate to other people. It's like, yep. why are you going to this? very unknown field that is called regenerative agriculture because I feel it. Yes. Okay. And just, uh, okay, why don't you just, uh, I don't know, go to a more quantitative, I don't know, um, something more more real, more um, less vague. Uh, I mean, it, it's not vague, the word, the word I used to describe regenerative agriculture. It's more like a, uh, intangible as you said um so so yeah uh the struggles i've been facing like uh, doing a phd in regenerative agriculture in a place that regenerative agriculture is not a thing um it's that they're being they, they encourage me like a lot for example that that's not a, a problem my supervisor he's just been great but she um they are constantly asking me what is regenerative agriculture we have to define it in order to 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 define which farmers are regenerative or how are you going to work with something that you cannot define first what are the principles the processes the outcomes what are you going to do with that so uh, at this point it's really uh, how do you because i study animal welfare so they say how are you going to study animal welfare uh the impacts of regenerative agriculture on animal welfare if you don't know what animal welfare really is um regenerative agriculture really is so that's kind of what the struggles i've been facing but um so far it's been it's been a journey but it's been a good journey i really appreciate you sharing that because it's that is so common in this movement we feel really alone right and we feel really stuck in trying to get across what it is that we're so insanely passionate about, and yet it feels like we can't even make it tangible for other people. And isn't it funny that it's like where people naturally go because of just our, the way we've kind of thought industrially for so long now that it's like, I need to know the list, like what's one through 10 processes, like boom, boom, boom. And it's like, but that's kind of the whole thing of regenerative agriculture is when we define it, we lose what it is. You know, it's like, that that's what people I feel like need to it's like you have to be comfortable with not knowing because we don't know so much right but what we do know I mean like I was saying earlier it's like just starting to realize those connections of those relationships underground that is new like what in the past 10 years or less maybe five um we know something like 10 percent of the microbes that are living in the soil like the name names for them and it's like we, we don't know so much. And so, yeah, I think a lot of it is like, if we can step back and, you know, telling people who are asking you, you know, what, what are you even doing? And it's like, well, this is about relationship, you know? And like you said, it's about connection with nature and connection with a community and meaning. And that's really the root of it, you know? And then there's different things we can talk about, like, how much carbon is getting sequestered? Like if we really wanna measure things, we can measure some things, soil health, all that stuff. Um, how much water can be held on an, like an acre of land? I talk about that in, in some of my talks where it's like for every 1% of soil organic matter added to an acre of land, it can hold an extra 20,000 gallons of water. Well, that is dealing with drought, flood, wildfires, like all of these different things, right? So it's really, trying to create some tangible pieces, but keeping the aspect that no, it's, it's not clearly definable. And that's the whole point is the way we've been doing things was definable to a fault, 
to the point where we have the, a level of process that is so damaging and so degenerating, not just to the land and to animals, but to humans as well. Um, I, I don't know if that helps at all, but it's, I totally feel your pain. And the more you can connect with people who get what you're talking about, the more you're going to be like, you know what, if you don't get it, that's okay, because I know what I'm going after. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you. I think I just saw a comment from Randy. Randy said we ended up at the same place of it's not a checklist, it's a connection to the land and people that is con constantly in progress. And BR said for the longest time, my three best friends have been the ladybug, earthworm, and honeybee. That was my earliest introduction to regenerative agriculture as a kid growing up in Southern Africa. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's that it's that thing that you can't really explain, but you know you feel it. And it gets to that emotional level and that soul aspect of who we are. And we've, we've lost that in our modern society. So I, I really think the answer is the more people who feel that and then realize there are other people who feel that, that's what's going to move this thing in a way deeper and more impactful way than anything else, honestly. Um, and that's, that's what I feel like we have on our side, if we want to say it like that is this aspect of we we feel like we have that piece of it and we have that together and we're just going to keep moving forward and <clears throat> at the end I'll, I'll share those words I was talking about earlier by Clarissa Pinkola Estes that I think will perfectly encapsulate that so anyway any other comments I think I saw another one It looks like uh, Biara would love to get a copy of the book for our library here on their land. I'm thanking you. I think that's a good next step of like, how can folks continue to interact with you and the work and um, what are ways people can tell, do the storytelling and for their own operations? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually in the midst of forming a nonprofit called Project Dung Beetle. Um, and my main focus right now is getting these these panels out to farms and ranches and ultimately I don't I don't want farms and ranches to have to pay a lot or possibly anything maybe there can be an application process I would love for you know people with money who want to help support farmers and ranchers help to pay for this because you guys are doing tons of difficult work and it's like, how, how can the community help support that and help educate more people and get more support for you on that community level? Um, so you can reach me at, um, my email is mandy at projectdungbeetle.org. Um, and that I am in the very early stages of getting all of that set up. So I will be figuring that out, but that I'm in that process with James Ranch of finishing up uh, this whole series that we're doing. And we've only got those two panels right now and we're working on the next five. Um, and then that installation will go in. And so I'll, I'll have something ready. Um, and I do have that amazing artist. Her name is Mickey Harder here in Durango. Um, she, she wants to be my illustrator. So if you're like, well, I don't have cattle, I have sheep. Great. We'll add in a sheep. We'll do a new sheep, you know, panel with sheep in the middle. Um, anything that can help because I, I know the struggle of getting people to like, to, to really get this and to really feel what you're doing. Does that help? <laughs> answer. Any more questions or comments from anybody? Oh, I'm also, um, uh, I would love to do talks for anybody too, um, to help, you know, if you have people who want to know more about what you do, if there's a way I can help by doing education on that. I did one um, just uh, earlier this month that was super cool. I kept it to like 12 or 15 minutes and I got so many questions at the end of it it turned into like a 45 minute thing and it was super fun everybody's like having fun and asking questions and we're getting through some tough questions that are out there like the issue with uh, but cattle are bad you know that kind of thing and it ended up being a really good positive thing so I just want to throw that out there cool we've got a question on the phone um that person wants to go ahead
It takes a second to get unmuted. <laughs> no worries. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. Um, morning. Thank you for the information you are presenting. Um, one of the things that I would like to suggest perhaps is um, I live in the Four Corners region um, of the Navajo Nation, mm -hmm. and our healthy soil is not rich and brown. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so maybe you could diversify the illustrations of what a quote unquote healthy environment looks like. Um, I think that would be really beneficial because, um, you know, it kind of helps. Um, my soil will never be the color of brown, a deep, rich brown, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about. So um, I think that's kind of interesting to incorporate. And then um, <clears throat> also the, I think, I'm not 200% sure here, but didn't regenerative agriculture start in Africa? Is that its origins? Um, because, you know, if you're going to be an effective storyteller, you kind of need to tell the origin of where a practice started from. That's just from an indigenous uh, point of view because I'm Diné. Um, so uh, I think... I don't know where it originated from, but I think the modern day practice of regenerative agriculture might have started in Africa. Um, that might benefit the young man from Brazil who's doing his PhD on this. And, um, but thank you very much. It sounds really interesting. I did eat at the James Ranch restaurant this summer in June. Um, I think I might have seen a panel there. I'm not 100% sure. Might have was seen it one. up in June? No, not yet. We're just okay. getting a, a couple of them installed this week. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, yeah. So as far as, I mean, as far as I know, in terms of the terminology of regenerative agriculture, from what I know, I think it was, um, uh, was it J.I. Rodale who coined the term? But that's kind of the issue, again, with that whole defining aspect. It's like, this is not where regenerative agriculture began. There are deep indigenous roots of regenerative agriculture. It's just that now we're terming it regenerative agriculture. Um, and so I think there are so many practices across the world that really embody regenerative agriculture. But um, yeah, if we're really looking for where it began, we'd have to do some, some, some digging. Um, but that's something I, I always want to make sure to get across is this is not a new thing. This is this has been going on for so long. It's we interrupted it with this whole industrialization process that really ramped up in the mid 1800s, and then, gosh, GMOs got introduced in the mid 90s. I mean, it's it's pretty recent that we've really gone down this more mechanized industrial path. And so, I absolutely appreciate what you're saying. Um, and then, as far as landscape, uh, yeah, so that is what it looks like at the James Ranch. Um, but I will say uh, there was a documentary I watched this past summer called To Which We Belong. Um, it's uh, recently been released, I want to say maybe on Netflix. I can't, I can't remember. Um, but if you look up To Which We Belong, uh, James Ranch is actually highlighted in that documentary. It's really interesting. Um, and there was a part in there where they showed um, in, in Africa uh, where there was only 20% ground cover. It was completely desertified. And within a year of doing regenerative practices on that land and moving animals in a, in a holistic way, um, it was 75% ground cover. So there are not many true deserts in the world. I know I, I'm also down in the Four Corners area and I know how desertified it is down here. So there's definitely a, an aspect of, we have very different terrain down here, especially as you get into New Mexico and Arizona and Utah. Um, California, you know, Nevada, uh, but there are regenerative things we can do and you can increase soil health and even get some of that, you know, more rich carbon rich soil. Um, I would have to do more research on that, but I do, I do think there's a lot we can do to help increase, you know, water holding capacity of land, um, soil health in general, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things I recently read is that they just 
you know, just moving cattle and having them impact the land for just a little bit and then moving them on because there's nothing to even eat there, it regenerates. Because like I was saying earlier, there's a dormant seed bank in the land um, that is waiting for those correct conditions, right? So anyway, just something I threw out there. Um, thank you for your, for your comments. I think I just saw another um, comment come in. Yeah, just a little bit like, um, of a follow-up of the last question uh, about the origins of the, the term regenerative. From what I read, yes, I think the, the first one to in coining the term was the Rodale Institute. But um, there's an important um, an important nucleus of uh, holistic management that was born in Zimbabwe, the African Center of Holistic Management in 1992, and it was co-founded by Alan Savory. So there are exactly that. There are some very interesting storytellings that can be mm -hmm. dragged from, from that experience uh, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, he's he's been doing this work for, gosh, um, trying to think of when. I mean, it's it goes back decades. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. He has a TED talk from 2013 um, about regenerating. And it's just, it's fantastic if you haven't seen that. <clears throat> so yes, thank you for, for pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, and we do have a question in the chat. Um, Randy is asking, is there any part of you that feels that regenerative is already being diluted or co-opt? And how do you feel about fighting the semantics of all this? For instance, Walmart is going to be regenerative company by 2030. Yes, I totally, and that, that's kind of what I was touching on a little bit with talking about the USDA grants that recently got awarded <clears throat> that absolutely, I mean, look at what happened to organic, obviously. It's like that, that's what happens when it gets into that mainstream aspect. And so keeping that integrity of what regenerative agriculture is, I really think that happens at a community level through face-to-face -face conversations with people, because when we're just all, you know, on social media or whatever it is, it's, or just online in general, it, it can get really watered down and really diluted. Um, and, and I feel like it's more in those intimate conversations and intimate community settings where it's like, no, like that's great. Like they're, they're trying some different things and it's better than what they were doing and that is needed, right? However, that's not the true essence of what this movement really is. And so I, I completely understand what you're saying and it's absolutely happening. And I think all of us were worried about the day when we started to see that happen. And I, I feel like that kind of started, I don't know, maybe even a couple of years ago where it really started that slide of like, oh no, you know, now it's getting put into those boxes of like, what is regenerative agriculture? And it's like, that's the whole point. Just like um, Matthias was talking about, it's, it's not, that's, I think that's the thing we have to say is that it's it's not super definable. We have to look at this whole breadth of things that happen and all the interconnections and relationships. And you can't do that with these very specific, like, oh, do these three things and you're regenerative. It's better than before, but it's not what we're going for. So anyway, did I see another comment on there? Uh, Matthias just said, that's a great point. How can we protect the concept? Right, yeah. And again, I I mean, you can write about it. You can, there can be documentaries about it. I mean, there's ways to tell the story, but that's where we get back to that storytelling aspect. It's like, how do we keep the sanctity of what it means to regenerate land and be in connection with place when we have so, we've strayed so far from that as a modern society. Um, so yeah, I think, I think if we can keep it in that realm of like our community, because it's just like when you regenerate a piece of land and you've got more water holding capacity and you have healthier soil and you've got lower temperatures, that extrapolates out to the larger globe as well. It's helping to regulate global temperature. It's helping to unburden the oceans, which are taking in way too much carbon right now. Um, and I feel it's the same way with our relationships around regenerative agriculture. When we focus locally, all of us in our communities around the globe, when we focus locally on really connecting with other people about what this really is and what it really means and that more emotional connection and that level, that's how I think we have that global impact. So I don't know if, 
we can't really get bogged down in that aspect. I mean, it's easy to get, you know, discouraged, but that part of, you know, it's getting watered down, it's getting diluted. Fight that with your own words to friends and family and whoever will, will actually set down that, you know, aspect of it and listen, you know, that's what we really need to do is listen to each other. Um, and there's just another comment from Randy, um, um, but by not defining it, are we just allowing the Amazon Walmarts to define it surely by market presence? And then he's also saying that he agrees with you and just that it's a fascinating edge of the whole conversation. Yeah, it is. I feel like that's one of the toughest things that we're dealing with is how do we, how do we define it and yet not define it? Um, and I think that's something we work on as a community. Um, Maybe that, maybe we can even talk about that at the Regenerate Conference and breakout sessions, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to talk about some of the key aspects, which is what I'm trying to do with these, the storytelling um, panels is, you know, okay, well, look at carbon sequestration, look at water holding capacity, look at, you know, the impact that these ruminant animals have on land when they're in, you know, when it's in accordance with nature. And, and those are the pieces of it, but it's like, but also step back and look at the bigger piece, like look at the biodiversity you're creating, look at the fact that you're not spraying chemicals, look at, you know, all of the pieces that go in with that. It's like, that's regenerative. Look at the community you're building, look at the relationships. And so, yeah, it's, it is a conundrum definitely because we're looking at defining so that it's not yeah, co-opted, and yet at the same time, it can't be defined, and that's the true essence. So, I didn't answer your question, I don't think, but <laughs> but that's the best I can come up with right now. Uh, we've got a hand, Lily. Okay. If you want to go yeah, I'll just chime in here. Um, I'm a co-hub leader for one of the Savory Network hubs in the state of Colorado, and. What we're trying to do right now, because the Savory Institute itself has not, you know, come up with its own definition of regenerative and it's not putting a definition out there for it, but the monitoring protocols that they're developing right now with the ecological outcome verification is just so based on like, you know, the qualitative and the quantitative parts of what you're seeing your landscape do, whether that's water holding capacity and carbon sequestration, or whether that's just visually seeing less bare ground and a pasture that you've been changing your plant, your, your management on. Um, but just that there's, there's definitely room for data-driven story, but also just the like, I'm out there on the land, this is what I'm seeing, but having it be based on um, the outcomes and not, like the, the ecosystem function that you're increasing instead of just, well, I did this and so I'm regenerative. So agreeing with, with all of what you're saying and um, just thinking that there's um, a need for this sort of standardized um, monitoring and kind of, um, yeah, just something standardized that we can all kind of get behind because I think that it can be up to interpretation, unfortunately, and then you do get corporations being able to use the term and, and not have any numbers to, to back it and whatnot. Right. I'm really glad you brought that up because, um, <clears throat> yeah, the EOV certification with Savory, I think, is a great example of, okay, well, if you are doing regenerative practices, we're going to see it in the results of soil testing or, or whatever, so or just how much biodiversity is in the pasture. Um, and yeah, maybe that is like, I'm glad that they haven't, you know, completely tried to define it because it's like, well, is that really showing the kinds of practices that are happening, you know? So yeah, I, I think that that probably is more the answer on that side of it than anything is, well, you can see whether or not it's happening right there, you know, is, is there more healthy soil? Is there more water holding capacity? Right. All of that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple more comments. Um, the solution is simple. Just Desc describe what you mean by it and how that may differ from how others such as Amazon, Walmart um, may define it. Um, it's about the ability to tell your story and keep it simple and captivating. Yep. Um, finding ways to reduce the anti cow zeal is a key piece for farmers and ranchers who have held a place and relationship with the land for a long time. They're still feeling under attack. Right. Um, 
and then one more in Brazil, agroecology has a strong political history, political and historical background that is, among other things, preventing big companies from claiming the agroecology concept. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's an amazing grassroots effort that's happening worldwide. And <clears throat> the more it grows and the more we have people really understand the heart of this movement, I think it's it's going to have a level of traction that you know, really can't be um, quote unquote fought, you know? Um, and that's the hope that I do have. It's like, there's, there's so much bearing down in terms of, you know, discouraging aspects of everything that's going on, but there's so much good. And, um, and that's, that's what I love to focus on. Cool. Any last questions or we still have plenty of time. So <laughs> anything folks want to talk about? I do, I do want to say um, in terms of like, you know, if, uh, it's always hard to get into this conversation with, with a vegan, um, but that's a question I get a lot is how do you talk to a vegan about this? And uh, one of the things is just, you know, if you look at after an industrial harvest, just the amount of death that's on that field because of the machines, you know, and the difference of that with a regenerative pasture, you know, even if you don't eat meat, it's like, if you're getting, you know, fruits and veggies from a place that's doing these regenerative things and protecting biodiversity and the soil and everything like that, you're, you're protecting life in a way that's not happening from the industrial side of stuff. Um, and I think that's ultimately, you know, what they want. It's just, uh, and it's the same as us. It's just a different way of going about it. So I don't know if I just stepped into some hot water there, you know, bringing that up, but that's something I get asked a lot is because it's the whole anti-cow thing, you know, anti-cattle, we can't have this. And it's like, well, are you focusing locally? And is it regenerating land? That's, that's it. But if your food is coming from thousands and thousands of miles away, you don't know what's going on there, you know? Um, and that's, yeah, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, one more comment. Um, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so I just want to touch base a little bit on, um, quote unquote, the origins of um, regenerative agriculture. As I've mentioned, I grew up, or I was born and raised in South Africa and uh, grew up um, up and down um, Southern Africa from KZN, Zambia, Malawi, Botswana, uh, Namibia. So Growing up as a kid, some of the stories that we were told by the elders were um, the tribes moved around a lot. They moved around a lot and the colonizers or the people that wrote the books called them hunter-gatherers. They called them that because um, as they were moving around, they were following not only, um, we don't have bisons back home, we have uh, buffalo. So they were following buffalo and the cattle that they were raising, which was grazing on specific um, farmland at a time. So if this um, fall, they are grazing in North Carolina, um, the tribe will be in North Carolina and will stay in North Carolina the whole winter and only move in probably spring or summer next year. So yes, we may not have, um, an exact date as to who or when regenerative agriculture began, but a lot of tribes back home were called hunter-gatherers because they were constantly moving with the different livestock or wild animals that they were um, domesticating or being um, stewards of. And also, secondly, I am a plant-based eater. I don't eat any animal products. That's not because of where they come from. But for example, beef takes a lot of energy for it to be digested in my stomach. Um, that is not only my personal stance on it, but uh, how we were raised back home. Uh, because meat, in particularly um, beef, chicken, most of the meat was ceremonial meat, only to be indulged at different times, probably because um, maybe we did not have refrigerators, but 
culturally, it was never something that you indulged in as frequently as people um, in the modern day eat meat. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying all of that. Um, that really helps to highlight some amazing aspects. And yeah, I, I'm glad that you brought up the plant-based part because yeah, it might deal with your culture. It might be a personal choice or both. Um, and that's kind of the whole point is I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, with regenerative agriculture, you're eating meat. And it's like, no, not necessarily. If you don't want to eat meat, you don't need to, but it's, it's just knowing where your food comes from and feeling good about that and having that nutrient density um, that's available and foods grown that way. So anyway, thank you so much for commenting on that. Uh, there's some more, um, there's a couple more questions um, from Amanda. Um, what would be one of the first things to do to begin to get into this more than what we have done so far? It sounds like uh, she has a ranch in the southern part of the state and run cattle on just over 25,000 acres and would like to utilize be pastures better, um, but mountains. I'm, I'm not totally sure what that means, but I'm guessing some weather and <laughs> extremeness. Right. Yeah. Um, so saying how, how do you do more on your land or how do you get more involved with your community in terms of understanding what you're doing? I think she's not able to uh, chime in um, using, oh, here she is, get more involved in uh, regen, regenerative ranching. So I would say reaching out to um, reaching out to different groups to learn more and get get more involved in community. I know there's um, a women in ranching group that would be amazing, and I really think just having that support and those tools, you know, at your disposal to, yeah, how how do you do this the way you really want to do it and expand in a way that's manageable. Um, the Regenerate Conference coming up, that's gonna be an amazing um, resource for people just to meet more people. So I think it's just getting involved with, you know, um, nonprofits like Kavira Coalition or Savory Institute or American Grass Fed or Holistic Management International. It's, there's a lot going on out there and a lot of information um, and, uh, and a lot of farms and ranches that are doing awesome stuff. So I think it's just finding, finding your community, finding people you can, you know, get more information from and learn from if that helps. <laughs> yeah. She's and also you can reach out to me too, and I'll, I'll see who I can connect you with as well. Awesome. Any, anything else from anybody? There's a hand. Go ahead. If you're a person on the phone, I, I, I can't hear you if you're Can you hear me now? Yep, there you are. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. This is Sunny Dooley. I had called in earlier, um, and I don't think I introduced myself because I was muted. <laughs> anyway, this is a far-fetched question um, that I think would be very interesting to start a conversation around. It's regarding regenerative agriculture, um, but also at the same time, I almost see a dotted line connection to um, the many groups um, that are environmentalists um, protesting for, uh, you know, um, extraction, um, oppression, I guess is a fancy way of saying it. but. Um, one of the things that I have made comments on regarding all of the fracking around uh, Chaco Canyon National Monument um, is the natural 
migration corridors that wild animals um, need to get from one place to another. And this past week on my iPhone news icon, of course, I've been artificially intelligent to, you know, oh, she likes this article, so let's send it to her. But um, there were migratory paths being affected by the mule deer. I can't remember where. Um, I'm going to say it's a northern state, uh, north of Colorado. But somehow I think the two sides can agree on this because movement of animal and their hooves is what is necessary to activate dormant seed to have healthy forests and grasslands and agricultural lands. So I think somewhere in this conversation that we're having, um, we need to start thinking kind of also in people holistically gravitating towards an idea or an ideal. So it's not necessarily a question, but I guess more of a comment that I'm thinking about. But I really appreciate what you're doing. I really, um, I can see the value of your panels and how important it is to get the story out there. So maybe somewhere in there you can throw in a wild animal or two <laughs> as well, yeah. you know, like, like maybe they're quietly applauding often around the edges or something like that. So anyway, thank you, that's all. Thank you, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's, it's hard to, cause you're bringing in like a bigger, you know, concentric circle of this thing, right? Where it's like, okay, now let's think of this bigger. It's like, we need these animals moving around. I think they're, um, they're trying to put in some tunnel or bridge over the 405 out in California or the five or something for mountain lions to be able to move. I mean, these are things we need to think about, you know, it's like when we have roads and fences and all these things in the way they can't move the way that they need to. And oh my gosh, that's, we get down some really, you know, crazy pathways with that because it's like, it's just a lot to think about, but it's a really important thing. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. It's, I think my thing with the, the panel, that first one that we, that they did a screen share on was to not have so much going on that people are like, what? But I also want people to understand, yeah, these added layers of it. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I totally get what you're saying and I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, any, any last stuff for anybody? The next rendition of your signs might need to have little like pop open things so that you don't see the deer, then you do see, see the deer and you can go through it at different levels. I love it. <laughs> um. Well, thank you so much, Mandy. This was really a great conversation. Um, thank you. I do have one other little thing I want to share before everybody yeah. jumps off. Um, this is, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I think especially with some of the, the conversations that came up, this will be very poignant. Um, so these are words from Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She wrote, uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Um, so we were made for these times. My friends do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world right now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. 
one of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, build signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire. To display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy toward others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things you can do. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this, in my uttermost bones, I know something as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth. In that spirit, I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see some or all of you at the Regenerate Conference next week.